Okay. I'm reading the rest of 19, which I think is like, um, 410 to 418? I'm not sure. I think it's 410 to 418. We'll see. Okay. So on page 410, John Brown, murderer or martyr? The gaunt, grim figure of John Brown of bleeding Kansas infamy... Wait, what the... Sorry, I just like... Let me try that again. The gaunt, grim figure of John Brown of Bleeding Canvas infamy now once again took the stage. After studying the tactics of the Black Rebels to Saint Louverture and Matt Turner, he hatched a daring scheme to invade the South secretly with a handful of followers, call upon the slaves to rise, furnish them with arms, and establish a kind of black free state as a sanctuary. Brown secured several thousand dollars for firearms from northern abolitionists and finally arrived in hilly western Virginia and some twenty men, including several blacks. At scenic Harper's Ferry, he seized the federal arsenal in October 1859, incidentally killing seven innocent people, including including a free black, and injuring ten or so more. <laughs> but the slaves, largely ignorant of Brown's strike, failed to rise, and the wounded Brown and the remnants of his tiny band were quickly captured by the U.S. Marines under the, com under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee. Ironically, within two years, Lee would become the preeminent general in the Confederate Army. Old Brown was convicted of murder and treason after a hasty but legal trial. His presumed insanity was supported by affidavits from 17 friends and relatives who were trying to save his neck. Actually, 13 of his near relations were regarded as insane, including his mother and grandmother. Governor Wise of Virginia would have been wiser, so his critics say, if he had only clapped the culprit into a lunatic asylum. But Brown, God's angry man, was given every opportunity to pose and to enjoy martyrdom. Although perhaps of unsound mind, he was clever enough to see that he was worth much more to the abolitionist cause dang dangling from a rope than in any other way. His demeanor during the trial was dignified and courageous. His last words, this is a beautiful country, were to become legendary, and he marched up the scaffold steps without flinching. His conduct was so exemplary, his devotion to freedom so inflexible, that he took on an exalted character, however deplorable his previous record may have been. So the hangman's trap was sprung, and Brown plunged not into oblivion, but into world fame, and a memorable marching song of the impending civil war ran. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, his soul is marching on. The effects of Harper's Ferry were inflammatory. In the eyes of the South, already embittered, also with Tommy Brown was a wholesale murderer and an apostle of treason. Many Southerners asked how he could possibly remain in the Union while a murderous gang of abolitionists was financing the armed bands to brown them. Moderate Northerners, including Republican leaders, openly deplored this mad exploit, but the South naturally concluded that the violent abolitionist view was shared by the entire North, dominated by brown-loving Republicans. Abolitionists and other ardent free soldiers were Free sol soilers, free soilers were infuriated by Brown's execution. Many of them were ignorant of his bloody past and even more and his even more bloody purposes, and they were outraged because the Virginians had hanged so earnest can't read has has ha <clears throat> had hanged, so earnest a reformer who was working for so righteous a cause. On the day of his execution, free soil centers in the north toiled bells, fired guns, lowered flags, and held rallies. Some spoke of St. John Brown, and the serene Ralph Ronald Emerson compared the new martyr hero with Jesus. The gallows became a cross E.C. Stedman wrote, and, and old Brown, also a Tommy Brown, may trouble you more than ever when you've nailed his coffin down. The ghost of martyred Brown would not be laid to rest. The disruption of the Democrats. Beyond question, the presidential election of 1860 was the most fateful in American history. On it hung the issue of peace or civil war. Deeply divided, the Democrats met in Charleston, South Carolina, with Douglas, the leading candidate of the northern wing of the party. But the southern fire eaters regarded him as a traitor, as a result of his unpopular stand on the Lecompton Constitution and the Freeport Doctrine. After a bitter wrangle over the platform, the delegates from most of the cotton states walked out. Oh, oops. When the remainder could not scrape together the necessary two-thirds vote for Douglas, the entire body dissolved. The first tragic secession was the secession of North Southerners from the Democratic National Convention. Departure became habit-forming. The Democrats tried again in Baltimore. This time, the, the Douglas Democrats, chiefly from the North, were firmly in the saddle. Many of the Cotton State delegates again took a walk, and the rest of the convention enthusiastically nominated their hero. The platform came out squarely for popular sovereignty and as a stop to the North against obstruction of the fugitive slave law by the states. <laughs> angered Southern Democrats probably organized a rival convention in Baltimore, in which many of the northern states were unrepresented. They selected a lead as their leader the stern-jawed Bryce President John C. Breckinridge, a man of moderate views from the border state of Kentucky. The platform favored the extension of slavery into the territories and the annexation of slave-populated Cuba. A middle-of-the-road group, fearing for the Union, hastily organized the Constitutional Union Party, sneered at it sneered at as the do-nothing or old gentleman's party. It consisted mainly of formal wigs and know-nothings, a veritable gathering of graybeards. Desperately anxious to elect a compromise candidate, they met in Baltimore and nominated for the presidency John Bell of Tennessee. They went into battle ringing handbells for Bell and waving handbills for the Union, the Constitution, and the enforcement of the laws. A rail splitter splits the Union. 
Elated Republicans, scenting victory in the breeze as their opponents split hopelessly, gathered in Chicago in a huge, box-like wooden structure called the Wigwam. William H. Seward was by far the best known of the contenders, but his radical utterances, including his irresponsible conflict speech at Rochester in 1858, had ruined his prospects. His numerous enemies coined the slogan, Success, rather than Seward. Lincoln, the favorite son of Illinois, was definitely a Mr. Second Best, but he was a stronger candidate because he had made fewer enemies. Overtaking Seward on the third ballot, he was nominated amid scenes of the wildest excitement. The Republican platform had a seductive appeal for just about every important non-Southern group, for the Free Soilers, non-extension of slavery, for the Northern manufacturers, a protective tariff, for the immigrants, no abridgment of rights, for the Northwest, a Pacific Railroad, for the West, internal improvements at federal expense, and for the farmers, free homesteads from the public domain. Alluring slogans included, vote yourselves a farm, and land for the landless. Southern secessionists promptly served notice that the election of the baboon Lincoln, the abolitionist rail splitter, would split the Union. In fact, Honest Abe, though hating slavery, was no outright abolitionist. As late as February 1865, he was inclined to favor cash compensation to the owners of free slaves, freed slaves. But for the time being, he saw fit, perhaps mistakenly, to issue no statements to quiet Southern fears. He had already put himself on record, and fresh statements might stir up fresh antagonisms. As the election campaign ground noisily forward, Lincoln enthusiasts staged roaring rallies and parades, complete with pitch-dripping torches and oilskin capes. They extolled High Old Abe, the wood chopper of the West, and the little giant killer, while groaning dismally for the poor, for poor little Doug. Enthusiastic little giants with, and little Dougs retorted with, "We want a statesman, not a rail splitter as president." Douglas himself waged a vigorous speaking campaign, even in the South, and threatened to put the noose with his own hands around the neck of the first secessionist. The returns, breathlessly awaited, proclaimed a sweeping victory for Lincoln. The Electoral Upheaval of 1860. Awkward Abe Lincoln had run a curious race. To a greater degree than any other holder of the nation's highest office, except John Quincy Adams, he was a minority president. Sixty percent of the voters preferred some other candidate. He was also a sectional president, for in ten southern states where he was not allowed to the ballot, he polled no popular votes. The election of 1860 was virtually two elections, one in the North, the other in the South. The South Carolinians rejoiced over Lincoln's victory. They had now had their excuse to secede. In winning the North, their rail splitter had split off the South. Douglas, though scraping together only 12 electoral votes, made an impressive showing. Boldly breaking with tradition, he campaigned energetically on his own behalf. Presidential candidates customarily maintained a dignified service. He drew important strength from all sections and ranked fairly close second in the popular vote column. In fact, the Douglas Democrats and the Breckinridge Democrats together amassed 365,476,000 more votes than did Lincoln. Wait, 465,476. Seventy numbers more votes than did Lincoln. A myth persists that if the Democrats had only united behind Douglas, they would have triumphed. Yet the cold figures tell a different story. Even if the little giant had received all the electoral votes cast for all three of Lincoln's opponents, the rail splitter would have won, 169 to 134 instead of 180 to 123. Lincoln still would have carried the populous states of the North and the Northwest. On the other hand, if the Democrats had not broken up, they could have entered the campaign with higher enthusiasm and better organization, and might have won. Significantly, the verdict of the ballot box did not indicate a strong sentiment for secession. Breckinridge, while favoring ex the extension of slavery, was no disunionist. Although the candidate of the Fire Eaters, he polled fewer votes in the slave states than the combined strength of his opponents. Douglas and Bell, he even failed to carry his own Kentucky. Yet the South, despite its electoral defeat, was not all that badly off in terms of political power. It retained a 5-4 to four majority on the Supreme Court, and although the Republicans had elected Lincoln to the presidency, they controlled neither the Senate nor the House of Representatives. The federal government could not touch slavery in those states where it existed except by a constitutional amendment, and such an amendment could be defeated by one-fourth of the states. The 15 slave states numbered nearly one-half of the total, a fact not fully appreciated by Southern firebrands. Nonetheless, hot passions, not cool reason, now began to drive events. South Carolina, which had threatened to go out if the sectional Lincoln came in, proved as good as its word. Four days after the election of the Illinois baboon, by insulting majorities, its legislature voted unanimously to call a special convention. Meeting at Charleston in December 1860, the delegates unanimously voted to leave the Union. The fuse had now been lit that would eventually ignite a chain reaction of secession the collapse of compromise. Impending bloodshed spurred fanatic last-ditch attempts to co at compromise in the American tradition. The most prom promising of these efforts was sponsored by Senator John Jordan Crittenden of Kentucky, on whose shoulders had fallen the mantle of the a fellow Kentuckian, Henry Clay. The proposed Crittenden amendments to the Constitution, proposed within days of South Carolina's secession vote, were designed to appease the South. Slavery in the territories was to be pro prohibited north of 3630, but south of that line was to be given federal protection in all territories, existing or hereafter to be acquired, such as Cuba. Future states, north or south of 3630, could come into the Union with or without slavery, as they should choose. In short, the slavery supporters were to be guaranteed full rights in the southern territories, as long as they were territories, regardless of the wishes of the majority under popular sovereignty. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Under popular sovereignty, federal protection in a territory south of 3630 might conceivably, though improbably, turn the entire area permanently to slavery. President-elect Lincoln flatly rejected the Crittenden scheme, which offered some slight prospect of success, and all hope of compromise evaporated. For this refusal, he must bear a heavy responsibility. Yet he had been elected on a platform that opposed the extension of slavery, and he felt that as a matter of principle, he could not afford to yield, even though gains for slavery in the territories might only be temporary. Larger gains might come later in Cuba and Mexico. Crittenden's proposal, said Lincoln, would amount to a perpetual covenant of war against every people, tribe, and state owning a foot of land between here and Tierra del Fuego. The secessionist exodus. As the new year dawned and the Crittenden Compromise spiraled toward failure, six other states of the Lower South, although somewhat less united, followed their leader over the precipice. Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. Four more were to join them in the spring, bringing the total to eleven. With the eyes of destiny upon them, the first seven seceders, sece seceders formally meeting at Montgomery, Alabama in February 1861, created a government known as the Confederate States of America. As their president, they chose Jefferson Davis, a dignified and austere recent member of the U.S. Senate from Mississippi. With what he <clears throat> excuse me, he was a West Pointer and a former former cabinet member with a wide military and administrative experience, but he suffered from chronic ill health as well as from frustrated ambition to be a Napoleonic strategist. The crisis, already critical enough, he was deepened by the lame duck interlude. Lincoln, though elected president in November 1860, could not take office until four months later, on March 4, 1861. During this period of protracted uncertainty, when he was still a private citizen in Illinois, the secessionist movement gathered further momentum. President B Buchanan, B B B oh my God, Buchanan, the aging incumbent, has been blamed for not holding the seceders in the Union by sheer force, for wringing his hands instead of the secessionist necks. Never a vigorous man and habitually conservative, he was now nearly 70, and although devoted to the Union, he was surrounded by pro-Southern advisors. As an able lawyer wedded to the Constitution, he did not believe that the Southern states could legally secede, yet he could find no authority in the Constitution for stopping them with guns. And even if he had used force on South Carolina in December 1860, the fighting almost certainly would have erupted three months sooner than it did, and under less favorable circumstances for the Union. The North would have appeared as this heavy-handed aggressor, and the crucial border states so vital to the Union probably would have been driven into the arms of their wayward sisters. Oh, for one hour of Jackson, cried the advocates of strong-arm tactics, but old Buck Buchanan was not old Hickory, and he was faced with a far more complex and serious problem. One important reason why he did not resort to force was that the tiny standing army of some 15,000 men, then widely scattered, was urgently needed to suppress the Indians in the West. Public opinion in the North at that time was far from willing to unsheathe the sword. Fighting would merely shatter all prospects of adjustment, and until the guns began to boom, there was still a flickering hope of reconciliation rather than a contested divorce. The weakness lay not so much in the Buchanan as in the Constitution and the Union itself. Ironically, when Lincoln became president in March, he essentially continued Buchanan's wait-and-see policy. Farewell to Union. Secessionists who parted company with their sister states left for a number of avowed reasons, mostly relating in some way to slavery. They were alarmed by the inexplore, in, inexorable tipping of the political balance against them, the despotic majority of numbers. The crime of the North, observed James Russell Lowe, was the census returns. Southerners were also dismayed by the triumph of the new sectional Republican Party, which seemed to threaten their rights as a slaveholding minority. They were wary of free soil criticism, abolitionist nagging, and northern interference, ranging from the Underground Railroad to John Brown's raid. All we ask is to be let alone, declared Confederate President Jefferson Davis in an early message to his Congress. Many Southerners supported secession because they felt that their departure would be unopposed, despite Yankee yop to the contrary. They were confident that the clod-hopping and cod-fishing Yankee would not or could not fight. They believed that northern manufacturers and bankers, so heavily dependent on southern cotton and mar markets, would not dare to cut their own economic throats with their own unionist swords, but should work home the immense debt owed to the or owed to northern creditors by the south, happy thought, could be promptly repudi re repudiated, as it later was. Southern leaders regarded secession as a golden opportunity to cast aside their generations of vassalage to the north. An independent Dixieland could develop its own banking and shipping and trade directly with Europe. The low tariff of 1857 had passed largely with southern votes, but who could tell when the greedy northern Republicans would win control of Congress and drive through their own oppressive protective tariff? For decades, this fundamental friction had pitted the North with its growing development of a manufacturing economy against the South, with an economy hugely dependent on agricultural exports, especially cotton. Worldwide impulses of nationalism, then stirring in Italy, Germany, Poland, and elsewhere, were fermenting in the South. 
This huge area with its indistinctive culture was not so much a section as a subnation. It could not view with complacency the possibility of being lorded over then or later by what it regarded as a hostile nation of northerners. The principles of self-determination of the Declaration of Independence seemed to many nor southerners to apply perfectly to them. Few, if any, of the seceders felt that they were doing anything wrong or immoral. The thirteen original states had voluntarily entered the Union, and now seven, ultimately eleven, southern states were voluntarily withdrawing from it. Historical parallels ran even deeper. In 1776, 13 American colonies, led by the rebel George Washington, had seceded from the British Empire by throwing off the yoke of King George III. In 1860 and 1861, 11 American states, led by the rebel Jefferson Davis, were seceding from the Union by throwing off the yoke of King Abraham Lincoln. With that burden gone, the South was confident that it could work its, out its own peculiar destiny more quietly, happily, and prosperously. Okay, yeah. I think that is all, unless I were to read varying viewpoints. Mm. I think that one's just about, um, yeah, it says the Civil War, irrepressible, irrepressible. But yes, okay, chapter 19 is done, yay!